Welcome to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm your host, Prudence Robertson. Abortion drug crackdown. A decision out of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals would significantly limit access to the abortion drug Mifepristone, which accounts for more than half of abortions in the nation. With the case moving rapidly and having reached the Supreme Court, will these deadly drugs finally be taken off the market? Attorney Mary Fiorito of the Ethics and Public Policy Center joins us for analysis clashing courts. While some lower courts issue rulings that could stop access to abortion drugs, Democrat attorneys general are working to cement policies that would make access to mifepristone permanent in over a dozen states. Former Texas Solicitor General Heather Hacker explains the details and how conflicting lower court opinions could impact access to these drugs moving forward medical perspective. We hear from Dr. Gracie Christie about how restricting mifepristone will save moms and babies. We'll also discuss new risks moms could be opened up to if abortion activists keep pushing misoprostol-only abortions. In just the last couple of weeks, the abortion landscape in the U.S. has changed drastically. Last week, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed into law an abortion ban that could save thousands of lives. The Heartbeat Protection Act bans abortion after six weeks of pregnancy. It also prohibits state funding for abortions for non-Florida residents and funding for dangerous chemical abortion drugs. This has been a long time coming in a majority red state, though a lawsuit concerning Florida's 15-week limit on abortion could keep this new law from taking immediate effect. And the U.S. Supreme Court is set to weigh in on a case out of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals that could ban sending the abortion drug mifepristone through the mail. This is developing coverage. The case is Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine versus U.S. Food and Drug Administration. It originated in a northern Texas district court presided over by Trump-appointed judge Matthew Kazmierich. The case was elevated to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which ruled that abortion pills must be received by a doctor in person, no later than seven weeks gestation. Now we wait to see if the high court will affirm that ruling or send it back to lower courts. Joining me now with more details on what comes next in this case is Mary Fiorito. She's an attorney and a fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. Mary, thanks so much for joining me. Talk to me about who brought this case to the courts in the first place and what they were seeking. Why did they choose this avenue of the courts to try and stop mail order abortions? Well, the suit was brought by a group of doctors, uh, collectively and individually. The Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine would be an umbrella group of doctors like the Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists and the American College of Pediatricians, and then several doctors in their capacity as individual doctors, um, several of those who worked in emergency rooms. And they brought the case to the federal court because that would be the normal channel by which you could uh, challenge an FDA ruling. Um, this particular ruling on the drug mifepristone with its partner drug misoprostol was approved for abortion use back in the year 2000 in the waning days of the Clinton administration. It was very dramatically sort of forced through on an expedited basis. And the argument that the government used at the time, that the Clinton administration and the drug company used at, at the time, was that this was needed for emergencies, that this, would, uh, this was the only drug that could be used in particular emergency situations, which really wasn't the, the case, because we know that pregnancies are not generally life-threatening in, in an emergent sense. Um, and the judge in that case, Judge Kazmarek, found that the FDA exceeded its authority by ignoring what he called legitimate safety concerns about mifepristone, and that they relied on unsound reasoning and studies when they approved it. So that he would, he really felt that there were significant safety concerns, and those were all, you know, amplified by the, the groups of doctors, especially the emergency room doctors, 
who are for the most part the first physicians that see a woman who is having an adverse reaction to this combination of pills. Right, and, and talk to me a little bit more about that, Mary. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals made a point to, to point out that not only does this affect, these drugs affect the women who are taking them, it harms them, but it's really a liability for these ER doctors who are receiving these women into emergency rooms. Talk to me about that and, and your perspective on it. Well, it, it is very interesting to see the perspective of these emergency room doctors. As I mentioned, they're on the front lines of women who are coming in with severe abdominal pain, hemorrhaging that won't start, uh, stop, rather, you know, other uh, pain and other concerns um, that they oftentimes, you know, the, the baby will not pass completely. And they have to then undergo procedures with, for this woman that essentially amount to them being complicit in an abortion surgery, which a uh, number of them, they have ethical uh, objections to them, that their conscience clauses as doctors allows them uh, to, to state when they're practicing medicine, they don't have to be involved in performing or, or you know, doing these ab abortions. But when women present in the emergency room with an incomplete abortion, they're put into the position of having to complete that abortion for her. And even in the cases where the baby has already died, um, that still puts a doctor in a terribly difficult uh, situation. Of course, they're not culpable morally for because they had no intent to do it and they need to save that woman who has now come in with significant complications. But it's incredibly traumatic. I mean, I have a couple of doctors who are emergency room uh, physicians on call and um, a number of them have had cases, one with a surgical abortion where there was a perforated uterus, but the other one where there was a chemical abortion that hadn't completed. and. It didn't only upset them, you know, tremendously to have to see the baby's remains in that little pan next to the patient, but also the nurses and the anesthesia, uh, anesthesiologists and the other staff that were in the room. In one case I know of, the hospital actually had to bring in counselors for the medical staff that had to treat this woman. Mm. So, you know, the, the, the other side would have you believe that this is no different from taking an Advil or a Tylenol, and then you go home and somehow the baby mysteriously disappears. But that could not be further from the truth. There mm -hmm. can be significant, not right. only adverse medical reactions to this drug, but also, you know, emotional and psychological ones. Right. Um, probably the most prominent, you know, if the woman does complete the abortion at home and she passes the baby's remains, um, I, I'm sorry for being graphic here, but that often happens while she's sitting on the toilet and she can look down and see that small amniotic sac. And if she's having that abortion, um, you know, as late as the FDA was allowing it after 2016, which was a full 10 weeks, she can very easily come face to face with a small, tiny child. And yeah. then, you know, she goes through the additional trauma of flushing the toilet. So you can imagine um, what, you know, people who do Project Rachel counseling or other post-abortion counseling are experiencing when they are caring for these women who have undergone these procedures. Yeah, well, thank you for being so candid and explaining that, Mary. And unfortunately, we're out of time, but thank you so much for joining us and for sharing um, what you know about this case. Really appreciate it. Mary Fiorito, of the Ethics please. and Public thank Policy Center. Me. To walk us through more details surrounding this case, we're joined now by Tom Jipping, a senior legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Tom, thanks for joining me. Let's walk some of this back. FDA approvals impact the access American citizens have to certain drugs. Javier Becerra is saying that if the end result of these court proceedings is stopping mail order abortions, it will mean dire circumstances when it comes to Americans getting other drugs because it's gonna upend FDA approval processes broadly. Tom, why is he saying this and is it true? Well, he's saying it in order to uh, get people to think that the court decision with regard to this drug is, is much more uh, important than it is. And no, he's not wrong and he knows it. Uh, I think we should all expect that government agencies like the FDA should follow the law when they make their decisions. The law requires that FDA approval of a prescription drug as safe and effective, but it also requires a certain kind of decision-making process when the FDA is reaching that decision. Uh, the argument here is that the FDA did not properly go through that process, uh, and, and therefore, if the courts agree, the FDA would have to go through it properly again and conceivably could reach the same result. But uh, it, it, it's shocking, I think, for a cabinet secretary to say, if we require the government to follow the law here, 
they're going to have to follow it over there, and that's a bad thing. Yeah, very interesting. And and while we're, while we're on this topic of the Mifepristone approval process, can you talk to me about how it was initially approved back in 2000? We know the process was fast-tracked, and the FDA, like you said, did not follow the normal protocols when they first put these drugs on the market. Sure, there's a, there's a few things that are curious about that original approval. Uh, first of all, the, the fast-track process you mentioned is supposed to be restricted for drugs that treat life-threatening illnesses. Mm. So in effect, the FDA declared pregnancy to be a life-threatening illness. Uh, and then um, the, the kinds of evidence that a manufacturer is supposed to present uh, is supposed to meet a particular standard set by what's called the, the Administrative Procedure Act. And very shortly after the approval, uh, medical groups petitioned the FDA challenging uh, the inadequate process that they went through, uh, the FDA is supposed to respond to those kinds of petitions within 180 days, and they waited 14 years to respond. So it's it's almost as if, I'm not saying definitely, but it looks like the FDA was trying to short circuit the process, get something approved that might not have been approved through the regular process, and then trying to avoid any sort of spotlight or any sort of transparency about it. Hmm. Curious indeed. Tom, can you talk to me, going back a little bit, about how the Clinton and Obama administrations played a role in making these drugs more widely available, just for context? Sure, well, there's two, the, the, the court challenge today is about two different parts of the process. The one which we were just talking about is the 2000 approval. The other is two decisions, one in 2016, one in 2021, that uh, eliminated safety precautions that were originally necessary. And uh, at each step, uh, the FDA, uh, on, the, on the basis of almost no evidence at all, uh, kept broadening the ability to obtain these dangerous drugs uh, and uh, dropping uh, rules that had been in effect from the beginning that were intended to, to safeguard women's health. And uh, that's what this lawsuit is about. It's about both of those sets of decisions, uh, both of which appear not to have followed the law. Hmm. Interesting. And Tom, one more question before I let you go. If at the end of all these proceedings, it is court ordered that mifepristone may not be sent through the mail, do you think we can expect the FDA to comply? What's your prediction about what will happen next? Well, it is important to stress that this is a preliminary decision. The merits of whether mifepristone was legally approved, um, that's going to have that's going to be litigated in the future. Mm. The issue today is whether the that approval and those decisions dropping the safety precautions should be put on hold while the rest of the litigation goes forward. So even if the courts today say, uh, you know, we're, we're, we got a lot of questions about that. We're going to have to, you know, press pause on uh, the drug itself while the, the lawyers and the judges are working their way through the, the court case. Um, it, it, will, it would only be temporary until that final decision is made. Hmm. Uh, so it, it just procedurally is just important to, to understand these are important issues that this will be an important decision, but it's only the, an early step in what will be a probably a long process. Hmm. Well, thank you so much for explaining all of this so clearly. Tom Jipping of the Heritage Foundation, thanks for joining us thank and God you. bless you. While Judge Kazmierich's ruling makes its way through the courts, there's another case out of Washington State that we're tracking that stands in conflict with his decision. Led by Washington State's Attorney General Bob Ferguson, attorneys general in 17 states and the District of Columbia filed a lawsuit challenging any sort of ban on mail order abortion. A federal judge in the state of Washington affirmed their lawsuit, so now these states are acting as if the rules don't apply to them and plan to keep mailing out abortion pills for the foreseeable future. It's also coming to light that leaders in these blue states have been stockpiling abortion pills, likely for quite some time. To unpack this, we're joined now by Heather Hacker. She's a former assistant solicitor general in the Texas Attorney General's office and now a partner at Hacker Stevens LLP. Heather, thanks for joining me. Can you explain the latest on this case out of Washington? What does it mean that this ruling in the case conflicts with rulings out of Texas and the Fifth Circuit to stop abortions by mail. 
Yeah, so this lawsuit was filed in February. Uh, it seems like it was filed perhaps in direct response to the Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine's lawsuit that was filed um, la late last year in the Northern District of Texas. But as you mentioned, it was filed by uh, several state attorney generals. And essentially, they are purporting to challenge the 2023 uh, REMS protocol um, from the FDA. Um, but it's kind of a, a weird uh, position that they're in because they're challenging that. Yet, if that protocol was removed, um, the rules would actually be more strict, um, which seems to be uh, contrary to what they're trying to do, which is um, relax the rules. Mm. Um, so setting that aside, uh, the court actually shortly after Judge Kaczmarek issued his a preliminary injunction decision in the Alliance for Hippocratic Med Medicine case, uh, the judge in the Washington case also issued a preliminary ruling um, staying any action that the FDA would take regarding mifepristone, but the court there declined to make this ruling apply nationwide and only um, made it apply to the plaintiff states. Hmm. So only the, the states that um, participated in the lawsuit um, basically are getting the relief that they were requesting, which is that the FDA cannot change um, any requirements with respect to the REMS um, in application to those states only. Mm, meaning that abortion pills would still be accessible in those states, essentially. Heather, what's your reaction to the fact that some pro-abortion governors have been stockpiling abortion pills kind of, you know, leading up to these cases. Governor Jay Inslee in Washington says he's stocked up 30,000 doses of abortion drugs. Governor Gavin Newsom in California says he has 2 million abortion pills stashed away. So it strikes me a little odd that a state would be stockpiling a certain type of drug. Um, and it, it seems odd to me, I guess, because if the law was that, you know, these lawsuits at the heart of them is whether the FDA um, a, a rightfully approved use of the drug or um, whether the recent changes to the protocol complied with the law. And so if the drug becomes unavailable, it would be because there's no approval. And so um, it, it seems strange that, I don't know what they would be using the stockpile for unless it were, was to continue distributing it um, despite uh, the, the lack of approval if that is what ends up happening as a result of these court cases. Hmm. It seems dangerous for the people that live in those states. Heather, what are pro-life attorneys general doing in response to this? What, what can they do? So I think that there are several states that have filed amicus briefs in support of the um, some of the positions um, taken by the plaintiffs and the Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine case. Um, I'm not sure that they, you know, I don't know, I don't know that they necessarily are um, taking action of their own, but, um, you know, they, they are, uh, they're participating in the Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine case, at least some of them. Mm, good to know. Well, Heather Hacker, thank you so much for joining us today and for shedding some light on this. Uh, we're really grateful to have you on the show. God bless you. Thanks for having me. Coming up, we'll talk about Danco, the manufacturing company that was founded for one purpose only, the manufacture of deadly abortion drugs. I speak out about their connection to the FDA. Plus, we hear from a doctor who is highly concerned about the ways that abortionists will continue to promote abortions by pill, even with limited access to mifepristone. This, after the break. This is EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. Welcome back to the show. For this week's Speak Out segment, let's take a look at the company that makes mifepristone, Danco. Danco. 
This may be the first time that Danco Laboratories has ever been in the spotlight, and that's on purpose. Danco exists for one reason only, to make and sell mifepristone throughout the U.S. Danco was founded in the 90s during the Clinton administration, which worked together with the pro-abortion group Population Council to allow for the sale of abortion drugs here in America. At that time, there were no existing drug manufacturers who would agree to distribute mifepristone. To this day, we don't know the names of Danco's chief executives and board members. The group even convinced the FDA to approve mifepristone in a way that concealed the identities of those involved in its manufacture. The LA Times reports the approval happened in a Maryland garage surrounded by security. In terms of investors in the company, we do know that George Soros, David and Lucille Packard, and Warren Buffett have been named among them. While foreign groups like Aid Access also traffic abortion pills into our country, Americans should be gravely concerned that Danco is distributing abortion pills right here in the U.S., and the FDA seems to be supporting their work. Up until now, abortionists in the U.S. have prescribed chemical abortion as a two-drug regimen. Mifepristone, the first pill, starves the baby of nutrients and ends his or her life. Then the woman takes misoprostol to expel the baby from the uterus. But now, with the first pill, mifepristone, under fire, abortionists are promoting misoprostol-only abortions with the help of multiple media sources. This will result in women taking pills to induce labor unsupervised by a doctor or anyone, and they could give birth to live babies alone. Dr. Gracie Christie joins me now with expert medical analysis on this. She is an MD, and she serves as the senior policy advisor at the Catholic Association. Dr. Gracie, thanks for joining me. Talk to me about what concerns you the most about these misoprostol-only abortions. Can you explain the dangers based on what you know as a doctor? Well, you know, interestingly, for so many decades, we heard that abortion had to be legalized because it was very dangerous for women who would be driven to manage their own abortions and uh, do all sorts of strange and dangerous things in order to um, end a pregnancy that they found to be a difficult one. Now, um, with mifepristone, as you say, under fire, we are hearing voices from the media to say, well, skip the first uh, pill in the abortion regimen and go straight to misoprostol um, and manage it yourself. And there is, there is, there are no, um, there are no studies that show the effectiveness of misoprostol, the complication rate. These things just don't exist. Uh, it is with very, with great difficulty that that we got the that we have been able to get the FDA to follow all the important. Um, safety pro uh, protocols and, and try to get them to use important safety protocols around the two-step abortion regimen. But now we're talking about sort of a Wild West approach where we just say, where people are saying, oh, let's just use misoprostol. Misoprostol is simply a drug that causes violent uterine con um, contractions and, as you said, induces labor. Um, I don't know of any of any studies that have shown this to be effective and at what stages it can be effective and what kind of complications women can expect. But um, to me, it sounds like a terrible idea to suddenly open the gates to something unknown like this. Mm -hmm. And there are so-called medical groups that have published things on these misoprostol-only abortions. The National Library of Medicine, the American Academy of Family Physicians, multiple others are saying that these one-pill abortions are safe and effective. Dr. Gracie, if you were face-to-face -face with some of these doctors promoting this, what would you say to them? I would say what I've had to say to many physicians, many nurses, many people who are involved in any of these professional associations of um, in the health in the health field, is that professional associations, sadly, are very often and in all these cases are captured by uh, a political ideology, a pro-abortion view of life, um, uh, a, a view of of our of our profession that isn't the Hippocratic view in which first we do no harm. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, many of many of these associations have been captured by these liberal, small liberal cadres, uh, which take possession of the whole group. When yes. I was reading up on misoprostol and people and, and all the different groups that were, were saying, okay, misoprostol is safe, we can use misoprostol without mifepristone. When I dug deep, when I dug a little deeper, they're simply parroting things that pro-abortion um, ideologically and politically motivated groups have been saying. 
Mm. So they're simply repeating lines that aren't uh, based on any scientific reality, and this is very dangerous for women. Yeah, it's extremely concerning. Dr. Gracie, we have about a minute left. Can you talk to me for a minute about abortion pill reversal? In Colorado, yeah. they're trying to ban abortion, abortion pill reversal. Talk to me about the efficacy of abortion pill reversal and, and why it's important now more than ever that women have access to it. I love abortion pill reversal. I've been involved in several uh, uh, in several um, occasions with helping women uh, get to abortion pill reversal and Thank even God. have prescribed. And what what it does is when you take the first pill of mifepristone, it starves the baby of of the hormone progesterone. So the reversal protocol is simply giving women progesterone to counteract that the the act of mifepristone. Um, so this is a very simple thing that we would do in any other medical uh, environment, and, and in fact, progesterone is given to women who are who are um, in, uh, who are threatened with an, a natural miscarriage mm. because of low progesterone. Um, so anyway, uh, abortion pill reversal has been known to work, um, and I encourage any woman who takes that first pill and feels regret to call abortion pill reversal. Go online abortionpillreversal.com and start on that on, on that um, protocol, which might save her baby's life. Mm, very good. Well, thank you for all the work that you've done on that and, and all that you're doing to support life. Dr. Gracie Christie, thanks so much for joining us. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. That does it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. But before I go, a special clip of our beloved foundress, Mother Angelica. She would have been 100 years old on April 20th. We hope and pray that she remains with us always as we continue her mission here at EWTN News. Don't forget, you can find us on all social media platforms at EWTN Pro-Life or email us at prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless. Or if we could stop abortion. You know why we don't stop it? We put the wrong people in and vote for it. 50 years after the Supreme Court's 1973 decision in Roe v. Wade, ultra-MAGA Republican officials continue to push at all levels of government for extreme legislation rolling back women's fundamental rights, including a national abortion ban. You could change the whole country. The whole country you can change. <sighs> Whoa, to us. Whoa if we keep voting for murder.